I like the fact that even though the technology is bilingual, when you read it, it's the same underpinnings, you know? So it's like, well, it should be in this menu. And it's like, okay, fine, here you go. Um, I'm Andrew Reinhardt from the University of York. Thank you again for coming. Uh, and thanks for Megan for, for listening in and for providing the discussion in a little bit. Um, one of my case studies for my PhD thesis at York um, was studying Skyrim VR. If you haven't played Skyrim, this is an open world game that was released in 2011, and then they repackaged it as a VR gaming experience in 2017, and oh my god, it was fun. Um, I played it for, yes, it's really fun. You know, it's okay to have fun when you do your work, right? Yes! <laughs> and so thanks for the dance, that's awesome. Um, so basically, you know, when, when playing this, you're playing with, on a Sony PS4. I was using the PS4 VR headset, uh, which, which I got with a micro grant from York, so thanks again. Um, and I, I wanted to see, uh, God, I had a lot of questions, because as an archaeologist of, of digital spaces, I wanted to see what VR could bring to that experience as an archaeologist, and specifically, what can VR help me as an archaeologist when I'm working in an open world? I don't care about the real world. Well, I do, but I don't. Uh, I like to work in digital spaces to see what's going on, um, and VR seemed to provide this really great opportunity to do so, and using Skyrim VR was a good sandbox because it's a controlled environment. I played several hundred hours in the original game, and I wanted to go and see what I could do. Now, as far as the tools are concerned, you know, for those of you who do dirt archaeology, and I used to um, in Italy and Greece, and uh, you know, we were using tools like you see on the slide here. And so with, with VR, you're limited. You have a headset, you've got, you know, I, in this example with PSVR, you've got wands, and then you have a camera that is looking at you all the time, which is actually pretty creepy uh, when you think about it, but at least it, it allows you to interact with that digital space, uh, so you have this kind of transmediation going on. So, you know, with those tools, though, depending on the game that you play, these tools do different things, and so, you know, it's, it's like having a multi-tool in No Man's Sky, um, or being able to turn that that, that hammer into a pick, into a shovel, but use using the same tool all at once. It's like your sonic screwdriver. Um, so this is a really wordy slide, and I'll, send, I'll put the slide deck up as public uh, open access after this, so you can actually read it. Um, but I wanted to do a lot of interesting things, or at least things that were interesting to me in this. I wanted to see um, you know, how the field work goes in doing survey archaeology, landscape archaeology, and Skyrim VR. Um, I wanted to see if I was asking different questions research-wise between how I would dig in the natural world versus how I do, uh, you do some kind of archaeology in the synthetic world. Um, I was really interested in the immersive aspects and phenomenology of working with these pixelated objects and working with understanding materials and how we interpret materials in a game versus materials in the real world. Um, and by the way, I hate using real world and virtual world. I prefer to use uh, what Ed Castronova says is the synthetic world and the natural world. Because right now we're, we're working in a blended environment. Most of you are on your phones, on your laptops, and whatever. It's real. The digital is real. So we can, we can kind of put that discussion to bed. Um, I wanted to start off also by talking about what's an artifact. And there are a couple of different artifacts that you'll find in games, specifically in Skyrim, but also more generally in other kinds of digital environments. Um, this is the uh, this is the main that you play, the Mason Bolag Ball. It's a really OP weapon uh, that you can pick up. And it is, man, overpowered. And, and so and so you get this, and it like it like sucks the souls out of people when you use it. It's awesome. Um, but you know you have this digital thing, and this digital thing goes from. Um, game to game, you can find it in older versions of the game in the Elder Scrolls universe. You can find it in Morrowind, for example. You can find it in Skyrim. It doesn't matter when you find it, you can find it here. And the cool thing about an artifact like this is if you have played the games at different times in your life, you will actually get the same artifact over multiple times. And so you have this multiplicity of, of, of digital artifacts that you can get, which is really weird. Um, and so also with the phenomenology, you know, when I, when I pick this up in Skyrim VR, it doesn't weigh anything. You know, it should. It should be really heavy, and so I would like to have some kind of resistance in the controllers to indicate that this is a heavy weapon versus like a, a dagger, which is really light. So you have different kinds of resistance and stuff like that, but you don't get it. Um, and with the materiality of something like this, you know, we're always working with pixels. The pixels are assembled in a certain way to say this is this kind of weapon, or this is this kind of tool, or this kind of whatever else. Um, and so you. Uh, you're using the same kind of material, which is electricity, basically, in order to do all of this other stuff versus material science in the natural world where you're working with bronze or you're working with iron, steel, what have you. Um, there's a separate kind of artifact in the game, too. 
you, I watched Interstellar for the 1700th time on the plane coming over, and at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, um, you know, McConaughey's character goes into a hypercube, uh, which is a four-dimensional representation of a cube for space-time stuff. In VR, this happened to me, and I did not expect this. Uh, what you're looking at here is called a glom. A glom is a four-dimensional sphere. Um, the way that the VR universe is created in the headset is you, it surrounds you in a 360 view. You're like in a fishbowl, your head's stuck in the middle of the fishbowl, right? And so you're looking around, and then all of a sudden I got glitched, and the game stopped working, but I could still move my head. And then I saw infinite universes of where I was right here. And he says, I was like, oh my God, Christopher Nolan was right. And so, <laughs> and so it's like, what do, what do, what do we do? Um, and so you can document, I have this on video and, and, and stuff. I was unable to reproduce it, however. Uh, so, but other people, when I went on to Reddit and stuff, because I, I, I'm a geek, um, I was able to find that other people had, had this experience. They just didn't know quite what was going on. And so when you're dealing with digital stuff, you have this kind of artifact. Which, which is this kind of residue of human agent interaction with hardware interacting with software that creates something that is unexpected. It's kind of, uh, as one of the speakers said earlier, Lynn, I think, uh, uh, emergent behavior. Um, you know, because code is complex. Code mixed with people, more complex, and mixed with hardware, even more so. And so weird shit like that happens. Um, other things that I wanted to do uh, was I wanted to, you know, we're talking about artifacts and we're talking about the digital and virtual and stuff like that. I'm like, what would be cool if I could take an artifact from the game and print it, um, you know, so that all of a sudden we have this real world manifestation of something that exists only in the digital. Uh, and so I did. Uh, I haven't printed it yet because it looks nasty, uh, but, but when I find a makerspace, I'm going to try it out. Uh, so basically, I, use, I try to use open source tools wherever I can. If I'm using Photoshop, it's just because I have it. I'm not going to tell you how. Um, but uh, you can also have uh, you know, things like GIMP, for example, which is open source uh, software for imaging and stuff. So you don't have to pay for it. You, know, you can always do the things that you need to do for free. Um, and so I was able to, to go into Skyrim, and there's a turntable mechanic when you're looking at artifacts, and you can use your tool to rotate this way and rotate this way. And then all of a sudden, you've got this 3D scan of something that you would normally do on a turntable in a light room when you're doing object photography. And so you're spinning it, and then you use software. And I've got the software that I used over on the left side of the slide um, in order to take that film, chop it up into thousands of images, and then you stitch them together to create what's called a point cloud, which looks remarkably like this pickaxe, which is something that our are familiar with. It, create, it then overlays the uh, point cloud with a texture, uh, which is directly from the game. And then you know, when I imported it into Mesh Lab, it looked messy, but then you're able to clean it up by you know, scrubbing and stuff like that, at which point you can export it to a 3D printable file so that you can get a pickaxe that's this big, or you can scale it up to something that's this big, or something like that. And so I wanted to see if you could do that in a digital environment. Extract something from the synthetic world to the natural world that didn't ordinarily exist, and you can. What else do we do? OK. Um, I wanted to talk about photography, too, because when you're talking about um, digital spaces and digital environments. Um, and even if you're talking about just, just regular landscapes, you, know, you look out there, it's like, oh yeah, there's Barcelona, it's amazing. And it is. Um, you, can, you can take those panoramic photographs with your phone or whatever, and, and, and that's great. And you get this strip that looks something like this. So I'm like, well, how do I get this in a game? How do I get this in a synthetic environment? And so you know, I'm wearing this hat, and, and uh, you know, I spin myself around for a 360 you know, uh, film. And then basically following kind of similar steps to working with the pickaxe and that I break up the film into, into distinct images. And then I have the computer stitched together. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the first mistakes. It looks really cool because what this is, is this is a Mobius strip. It's a one-dimensional recreation of a three-dimensional space in the game. And so it made this Mobius strip of a panorama. That's really freaking cool. Um, but it's wrong. <laughs> so, so, so it's like, well, maybe it is, maybe it is. But anyway, you start with something like this, you turn your hat to do the movie, you split it up into constituent images, um, and then ultimately you can either have the computer stitched together or you can cheat um, by basically matching the images and stitching them together by hand and then doing a crop. Um, in order to, I, I did this, and I'll show you something else in a minute. Thank you. Um, where I wanted. One of the big issues that I have with, with archaeo gaming uh, or with, with uh, this kind of synthetic world archaeology is that if I'm playing Skyrim, I don't want to have to have people buy the game. I, well, you should. Uh, I don't want to have people 
spend 60 bucks on something in order to see the work that I'm doing. So how do I extract that information and share it in a way that is publicly viewable, that has a very low barrier of entry? And so something like this, I can put up on my WordPress site with a free WebVR plugin, and it will recognize this as a 3D thing. And then if you have Google Cardboard, if you have one of those cheap $5 or five euro plastic headsets that just takes your phone, um, you'll be able to have the same kind of experience. And you can go to this world without having to have the game. You have that virtual experience without having to buy Bethesda's product. Um, I did the same thing um, with uh, doing a 3D walkthrough and the fact that you know, I recorded the walkthrough through the headset in this 3D immersive environment and it was able to split that video up using a tool, uh, I use PathTube, using a PathTube tool which is, which is you know, share, it's not shareware, it's basically you kind of like pay what you like in order to use this, um, in order to get a split screen stereoscopic 3D walkthrough so that you can put Google Cardboard on your face and you can have that 3D experience of walking through. And so if I want to share with you that experience, we can go through and, and, and have a look and you can see what I see. Or if you want to be ethical about it, you can see what me as the archaeologist wants you to see as the audience. Uh, and so there's a, there's a fine line here. One of the things that I'm trying to do is being able to record that 3D environment in a way that you can explore it too without having to buy the game and without having me direct your attention. Um, I also wanted to do things with GIS. Can you do GIS of a game? Yes. Um, and so I was able to find a topographic map that was, that was produced as a CC0 public domain map and was able to uh, import that map um, into, what did I use? I used Photoshop, um, I used Inkscape and whatnot. What Photoshop allowed us to do is to bring in um, the map in SVG layers as an image. So there's a layer for camps, and there was a layer for caves, um, a layer for, for topography and stuff like that. And then by importing it in Inkscape, it allows you to have that pass through to, I was using QGIS, which is open source, but use ArcGIS, that's fine, or some other software. And, and you're able to actually export those files into an AutoCAD readable file that you then import um, it's a QGIS, and all of a sudden you've got an interactive map, it's a GIS map, um, that you can start getting information from. And so this is what it looks like with all the different layers here. And you can turn these on and off, and you can do all kinds of interesting statistical analyses about how that synthetic world is put together. Great. Now in Skyrim, it's a built universe, it's a built environment. You know, and the designers know exactly what is where. But this is preparation for things that are coming. Um, you know, when you're talking about procedurally generated landscapes and procedurally generated spaces, that is to say, code and algorithm making things for people to explore that nobody's seen before. Well, in order to do that, we need to first start in this kind of sandbox in order to see what works and what doesn't, and then we can then take it to the next step and applying it to a place that hasn't existed before, even in front of the programmers. Um, I also took a quick side trip into psychogeography. You know, psychogeography is cool. It's, it's basically, how does, a city, how does a city make you move around in it? Um, and so with the map, you know, something like this, this is really horrible to look at, I'm sorry. But at least you can see like regions that the programmers have set up as far as what guides exploration, how to get from town to town and, and whatnot. So you have, you have that going on too, and you'll have that with the other maps that you produce as you go uh, to answer other questions about the landscape. Um, talking, I know I'm getting short on time, but talking on the, uh, um, uh, cultural immersion. Being in New York, we have access to the York Viking Center, which is pretty cool and not cool at the same time. Uh, and the fact that you ride in this little cart and you can smell the smells and see the sights and hear the sounds and all of that stuff, but you can't get out and do anything. And you're like, look, these are NPCs, these are non player characters, and I have questions about meat. <laughs> and it's like, I can't do that. And, and so, you know, in a game like this, and it, especially in Skyrim, because it is heritage or themed, it's based on um, the Nords, which is kind of this Norwegian Viking kind of people, you can have NPCs that you can talk to and stuff. And as you're designing these user experiences, or as an archaeologist, if you're using Unity engine with other kinds of things that you can create, you know, these NPCs and these quest builders and stuff like that, so that you can actually, as a player or as a visitor, go and interact directly with these things, and you can learn the lingo and, and find out more about stuff. Jorvik is doing something interesting here, but I think you can also supplement on the other side of things with something that is purely digital. Um, 
Let's see. Yeah, I know the dragon. There's always dragons. That's one of the hazards. You know, you, you go and you dig in the Mediterranean, you might have scorpions, you might have snakes and bugs and stinging plants and stuff. And Skyrim, it's dragons, bandits, you know. Uh, so has, hazards of the trade that you never thought of until you started doing this kinds of stuff. Um, and I know I'm getting pretty close to the end. Yeah, so this is the last slide. Um, and I was, I was talking about most of this already, the fact that we're able to use these tools that we would use in a natural environment, at a natural dig, but we can apply similar methodologies and similar pieces of software to a digital space. The more I work on the digital environment, the more I realize it's not all that different from the natural world. Um, and you know, with a few notable exceptions, like going into a four-dimensional sphere um, or being attacked by dragons, but still. You know, where I'm asking similar questions and I'm getting similar results. And the fact that, that in playing games like this, like Skyrim VR, or playing No Man's Sky or other kinds of things, people who play this, even though it's a role-playing game or a fantasy game, we're still kind of playing as ourselves. And we have the same kind of needs and the same kinds of questions um, that we would have in a natural environment. And that, that kind of struck me as weird. I don't know what I was expecting in doing this, but I'm like, you know, people are people. And so they're asking these same kinds of questions and having similar kinds of experiences, even though it's a fantasy place. Um, so, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to at least let you know what I was up to with that, and uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>